All right, got it. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, we're continuing to read the autobiography of Kwame Shakur, um, uh, my search for um, answers and truth and meaning. <clears throat> we're on chapter four today and we'll be taking turns reading. Now, what we have done in the past is start out with a tribute to ancestors. And we've had a lot of uh, ancestors' names read. I'm gonna read a few that haven't been mentioned, but anyone who wants to chime in with other people, they especially want noted today. Um, the first person I want to recognize is Ida B. Wells. She lived from 1862 to 1831. Uh, she was an African-American investigative journalist, educator, and early leader in the civil rights movement. Wells was posthumously, how do you say that? Posthumously, after death, right? Honored, <laughs> honored with a Pulitzer Prize special citation quote, for her outstanding and courageous reporting on the horrific and vicious violence against African-Americans during the era of lynching, unquote. She's someone who's kind of known in Chicago. In fact, they named a project after her, but she was a remarkable woman and I think deserves our honor. Secondly, another person I hadn't heard of did a little investigation, Ralph, Caron, and he uh, lived from 1923 to 2002. He was a Chicano communist organizer, and he was a leader of many local community associations and workers unions throughout his life. His whole family was involved. So if you want to look him up, it's an interesting story. And then another uh, young man, uh, well, I don't know how young he was. His name was Benjamin Lay, and he lived from 1682 to 1759. He was an Anglo-American Quaker, humanitarian, and early abolitionist. He stood about four feet tall, and he was a hunchback with a protruding chest. And in spite of his deformities, his strident anti-slavery activities culminated in dramatic protests against slavery. He shook up the whole Quaker church by calling out the people who had slaves and condemning it uh, within the church. And they tried to get rid of him, but they never could. Okay, that's, these are some ancestors I thought we hadn't talked about, so I thought I'd mention them. Thank you, thank right. you. <laughs> Okay, um, well, first of all, like uh, we have been reading the chapters along and I think people have noticed that there's been a juxtaposition of uh, being uh, Kwame being arrested and tried and imprisoned and then chapters that go back into childhood. We had a really good discussion. I think it meant a lot to me last week where we discussed some childhood um, things that happened to him and also lessons that were learned and derived from the past. So continuing on today, uh, the system we've used is by reading uh, the pages front and back by the moderators and then having people who've joined us to join in and reading. Uh, does everyone have a script? Uh, because if you don't have a script, then of course we will, um, you know, you won't be able to help with the reading. But <clears throat> I'll call your name, and if you want to, you can go ahead and read. So I'll start um, this. Um, yes. Lindsay, a couple things. Yeah. One is I, I can't I can't put the um, the text on the screen. So if uh, right. so, there's that. And then also, are we reading the statement of unity? Um, well, I was going to read it at the end, but if you uh, would prefer that it's read at the beginning, we I think last week we read it near the end. We've done it different okay. ways. Okay. So it, it, it's okay. a, it, if people would prefer to wait or do it now, I don't care. Yeah, it's, I'm, I'm good either, either way. Okay. All right. So 
Let's start. This is called Turning a New Leaf, this chapter four. Uh, Shakedown on 300. Anytime there were solid prisoners on any unit and the correction officers were coming on the unit to shake down, some of the guys would yell out through their doors that they were about to shake someone down to give everyone else a heads up. Quote, roll 309, the CO said, standing at my do door. Seeing that I was the one getting shook down, I stepped out of the cell and went and sat down on the mental chow hall food bench we all sat on during chow. One was located right in front of my cell. The two correctional officers then went into my cell and started going through it from top to bottom. My celly, Cece, was at work. So I watched at a distance while they went through both of our properties. I had been in prison for nearly nine months by this time and had been through this procedure several times. So I was accustomed to being violated in this way. However, no matter how many shakedowns you go through, you never quite accept it. You don't know to what extent they will tear up your cell afterwards. And you knew that many of these shakedowns were a part of the prison staff's way just to harass you and dehumanize you. Sometimes they wouldn't be looking for anything in particular. By the time they finished going through your cell, it looked more like a landfill with everything trashed and unrecognizable than a cell that you had to live in. It would leave you so bitter and angry that in time it would make you increasingly grow to hate the guards entirely. Your personal mail would be mixed up with your legal mail at times. Sometimes your celly's property would be mixed up with yours as well. I remember one time I walked back in my cell and my washcloth and towel were lying in the toilet. There was no rehabilitated purpose to something like that. It was outright disrespect and a way to terrorize you. I had times where they would take some of my cough drops and be eating them on the way out laughing. It didn't take long before the prison staff and I became mortal enemies. I didn't identify with too many of them. Even the ones that didn't fuck with you and treated you with some respect. I didn't make it my mission to step over the boundaries between us versus them. I knew if placed in the right situation, they would stick to the blue coat of silence and possibly be forced to be on some bullshit too in order to please their superiors and higher ranking officers. Why are y'all taking my soap and toothbrushes though? I said as I watched them throw a few of my hygiene items into a trash bag. Quote, because according to policy, you're only supposed to have one toothbrush and no more than two bars of soap. I swear y'all break that same policy every day. When y'all want to harass us, y'all use that same policy to do so. Quote, we're just following procedures. You're not supposed to have no more than allowed hygiene items in your cell, unquote, the white female CO said. The other CO that was shaking me down was a black heavyset dude. He didn't say anything. I had seen this shakedown crew before. So I knew what time it was. He would go along. He would go along. Oh, does people not hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. I hear you. Yeah, I get some sort of bullshit ad keeps coming popping up on my feed. Um, um, does, okay. Um, let's see. The other C CO that was shaking me down was a black heavyset dude. He didn't say anything. I had seen this shakedown crew before, so I knew what time it was. He would go along with whatever the other white officers did. Trade house nigga. There were a lot of black correctional officers who were nothing more than black on the outside, but white supremacist supporting caste and how they operated around the prison. It didn't take me long to realize that a lot of times it didn't matter what color the officers were. The black ones were often just as bad or even worse since they would try to prove their loyalty to their white counterparts. Um, when I went back into my cell, I noticed all my property and CCs were still separated. It hadn't been the worst shakedown this particular time. They just took a lot of miscellaneous stuff as they always did and all the extra hygiene we have. I was most certainly mad about the hygiene being taken, but I figured I would just have to replace it. 
All the officers knew that we all had extra hygiene. It would be foolish if you didn't keep it. Most would never even put a hand on it because everyone had extra hygiene just in case we went on lockdown or somebody needed a bar of soap or something. Some guys would keep lots of it. I personally only had a few extra of everything, not only because I didn't want an asshole to shake me down and use it to harass me, but my money was limited. I didn't get a lot of money from my family that I could afford to lose. Around the time of the shakedown, I was on idle with pay since the yo-yo factory had recently been taken out of the prison. I'm not gonna lie, I was actually happy and felt fortunate when I got this prison job. This was the first of its kind at Wabash Valley Correctional Facility. We were getting paid actual minimum wages like we were at a real job on the outside. I was making $6.99 an hour. We had to go through an interview process and everything to get one of these three shifts they have. Because I had just gotten to the prison and didn't have any write-ups at that time, these job openings opened up. I was given one of those positions. Under prison conditions, this was equivalent to working at Ford Motors when they first became a blue collar job in Detroit. The only downside was that you had to pay half of what you made every two weeks for room and board, which went straight to the prison. And if there was a victim or victims in your case, case or you had to pay child support, that they would take that out of your paycheck as well. Since they recovered the bank money and I didn't have any kids, I was left with $150 or more in my prison account every two weeks. Again, under prison conditions, I was part of this new middle class they had created. If you had a yo-yo factory job, you could buy all the tobacco, weed, or drugs you wanted from a lot of the drug dealers. They knew you were good for it up to a point. Most of the money I made, I saved up for a lawyer and to support myself. That lasted from May 99 to October 99. Then they outsourced our cheap labor to Mexico, I heard. When that happened, we were all given A pay while we were on idle with pay. I think that amounted to $50 a month. I'm going to stop now. And uh, Sister Anna, do you want to continue reading? Okay. Looking back. On the yo-yo factory job, I have for a short stint, I can't see why corporation partnering it with prisons would take advantage of prison slave labor like they did. While many companies were outsourcing to other countries, many turn to, um, I'm sorry, the lighting's kind of bad in here. Um, insourcing domestic prison labor. Not only did the prison made a lot of money just off of what we paid them with the, excuse me, with the room and board deduction they made off of our free laborers, these corporation made a killing off of a control labor force that was very um, malleable, malleable. What I mean by, I'm sorry, the lighting is so bad here. What I mean by that um, is that they could uh, fire you for no reason. They would speed up production and manipulate you to comply if you wanted to keep your job. They had a workforce with no union protection. So we wouldn't strike or try to negotiate for higher wages. It was literally a modern day slave plantation. Yet we want happier slaves since it afforded us a means to support ourselves while we were down because most guys had habits of various kinds. It gave us the means to support our addiction as well. I noticed during my first year in prison, how plentiful drugs and all kinds of contrabands was living inside of prisons was like living inside a small town. 
you had your drug dealers and you had your populations of drug users. You had guys with a click, cliches, clicks, I'm sorry. Um, cliche, usually guys are part of the same gang and from the same town or city who were the shot callers, the predators, the guys that had social status among the prison population. Then on the other hand, you have regular people that went to work every day inside just to survive. You had the correctional staff who would bring in the drugs, knives, or cell phones and make a killing of our black market. When our cell phone became popular, at one point in time, a correctional officer would easily make up to $2,000 off of one phone. It became bigger than drugs. At certain prisons, the correctional staff had their own contraband rings. Prison life opened my eyes up to how ridiculous so-called penal mm. rehabilitation was. If you were a, a drug dealer on the outside, you were more than likely one of the inside too. If you are a drug user on the outside, you are more than likely a drug user on the inside as well. The biggest difference between the two was the cost and price margin for everything. All drugs and contrabands were sold at higher prices on the inside due to the smuggling fees that were added on to the price as well as the monopolization of our contraband by a smaller number of individuals controlling the market. Mm -hmm. A little bit of weed that was only enough to roll up two joints, one for $25 set market price prices. If you were really cool with the guy, you would get that same bag for $8 and he would still make a profit off of the sale. When I first witnessed how the measure, wait a minute, how they measure those bags, I felt like I was being effed with a spike thing. <laughs> no grease. <laughs> they would literally uh, fill up, a, I'm sorry, it's so bad with this lighting, a crap stick cap and then uh, place it at in a folded piece of paper. Most of the time it was uh, prepackaged it and held in a sack of 25 or 50 like a drug dealer would what on the uh what well what, what on the street so they would they could easily distribute it as customers came and went. One of the first dope things I met and got cool with was this brother named Shorty. He reminded me of um Elsa's character in the movie Friday. He was always hustling just to buy some more crack. When he told me the reason that he was in prison was for drugs, I thought that was the most um, ironic shit I ever heard. The state of Indiana had given the brother 50 years for a little bit of drug possession. Like many brothers, who the police swept up every so often and what broadcasted on the streets whenever they made their sort of a small time drug arrest, Shorty had been one of those drug fiends arrested and sent away for a long time. When he got to prison, he kept doing what he was doing on the street, getting high. 
witnessing people like him and seeing a real dynamic of person of prison life, I realized that prisons aren't going to ever solve many of the problems that affect black, brown, and lower class people. People. It actually uh, reinforces criminal behaviors and make it more harder and solidified. Remember hearing a lot of politicians talking about getting tough on crime, building more prison, and the need to give people longer sentences during the height of the war on drugs. But all of those policies have only led to a higher prison population of black and brown people, overcrowding and a growing population of people who will be hardened criminals by the time they will release back to the quote unquote free world. Prison just teaches people how to be a better criminal and be better capable of eluding law enforcement technologies, techniques, I'm sorry. For example, I had always kept at least one knife in my prison cell nearly every shake town. I even experienced whenever I was in the general prison population, the guards never found any knife I had ever stashed in my cell. Like in the streets, it's more, it was more wise to uh, have weapons to defend and protection than to get caught slipping. I don't care how often the guards shook us down every year and found a few, a few knives. Every last one of us either had a knife in our possession or had access to anyone's knives. Sometimes we didn't keep them in our cells. However, they weren't far from being assessed uh, whenever we left our cell. That was just a part of prison life and culture. If you didn't possess a mindset like that before you went to prison, you were uh, you sure developed the mindset once you spent enough time in there and witnessed or heard about other guys being stabbed or killed. That's a part of that culture that would never change. For a drug addict to go to prison and have to endure that sort of culture and lifestyle, you transform what was originally just a medical disease into a criminal disease of survival. Now, when that drug addict leaves prison, not only does he still have the same drug addiction he had when um, he came in, or even worse, he's a more sophisticated criminal that discover how to support that addiction in many socially dysfunctional ways of criminality. This person may have even become transformed into a prison with a sociopathic disposition. If they endure a lot of torture and knew it self-evaluated and struggled against their social conditioning, I came across a lot of shorties in prisons, and I think they would have been better off if their addiction was addressed medically rather than penitently. Okay, somebody want to take this part right here? Uh, I see Hi has joined us, and um, Alyssa, our um, I don't think we have a visual on you, at least I don't see, but would you like to read? I'm actually just listening. I'm, do I'm doing a pantry organization right oh, now. Oh, okay. Um, well, um, hi, do you, I don't know if you have the script in front of you. Um, who else do we have in the room? I'm on here. I can read if, if y'all need me to. Okay, that would be wonderful. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I, I, Man, got, I got after you for me. Say it again. Okay. Man, I, 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 got, I got after you. 
All right. <laughs> Man, I need your help, buddy said, referring to the prison knife he ca- uh, knew I kept in my cell. Why, what's up, I said. Let's go in the cell and talk. He walked to the uh, into the cell, and he went on to explain to, uh, to me how this motherfucker named Gangster Brown had basically implied to everyone in his GED class that he was a snitch. Because Bud- Buddy hadn't been sent to lockup for a recent write-up that he had gone to the Conduct Adjustment, Adjustment Board, CAB for short, for Gangster Brown felt it was more to it. What I said indignantly, yeah, man, he said this in front of the whole class. I'm shitty as fuck, and I'm not letting this one go. I feel you. I wouldn't either. I said angrily. Instead of stabbing him, my guy, and you catching another case, let's just beat the fuck out of him, and that way we will send a message to everyone that we we aren't uh, going to allow people to put bullshit on, my, on our names. We weren't going to let that shit ride, period. CC walked into the room and we told him what was going on too. We all had a problem with Gangster Brown at one point or another, so we all agreed that we were gonna jump him when he came back from the inside wreck later that night. Gangster Brown was a brother who had been transferred from Indiana State Prison a few months before. He had been down for about 15 years and was on swole. He was a real life Debo character. A few weeks before, he had gotten into a pushing match with his brother named Heavy D on the on the unit. We kind of felt sorry for Heavy D because Gangster Brown had pulled his whole cart in front of everybody in the cell house during lunch uh, one day. After that, he started to walk around like he was the biggest, baddest motherfucker in the cell house. One, of, one thing I had always had, it was a bully, and that was what he was coming off as. The fact that he was he did that to Buddy, my ace boom coon, I knew he had to, I knew he had really bought that bottle of beer. Menace to Society movie quote that I used to use where whenever somebody really fucked up. It would have been different if his allegations were true, but I knew they weren't. Buddy just hadn't gotten a lot of right up since he had just started his sins at this point in his prison bit. Because of that, they weren't likely to send you to lock up if you received a class B right up. You just couldn't have a job or go to school anymore for like 90 days or 180 days. They may have moved you to another cell house possibly, but that wasn't something they did right away. I guess because they sent guys to segregation more often at the prison he had come from, Gangster Brown assumed that that was what we would have would have happened to Buddy uh too. Well, he was wrong, and we decided to punk and head him for uh buying that bottle of beer. One of the worst things you could call a, a, a stand-up dude in prison, in my opinion, was a snitch. You better know your facts before you falsely accuse someone of that and try to put that jacket on them. They had every right to retaliate if that jacket didn't fit and it, and we did we were determined to set an example later that night buddy cc and i stayed in uh in from outside wreck we wanted to plan our attack on gangster brown when he came back in from outside recreation he stayed in the cell next door to us in cell 310 we decided we were all rush into his cell when he went up into his cell and jumped him in there so as not to get caught None of us wanted to go back to lockup, so we hatched a plan that would allow us to complete our mission and not be punished by the prison uh, prison for it. We knew that all the correctional officers will be preoccupied with everyone coming back from uh, in from recreation, leaving the day room free of a lot of staff to view us. I think I was the most hyped up out of all of us. I was ready to turn a new leaf in prison. I had already lost my yo-yo factory job since they had taken it out of the prison. Peaches and I had broken up about five months prior, so I didn't have to have love to worry about anymore. I was growing more and more angry by the day as I started having more and more confrontations with the correctional officers. It seemed like they would go out of their way to dehumanize you, dehumanize you and use their badge to oppress you. If it wasn't the disrespectful way they shook our cells down, it would be just the way they would 
uh, condescendingly talk to you. Sometimes, sometimes they wouldn't even have to be talking to me. If I overheard them taking another prisoner, uh, talking to another prisoner in a disrespectful manner, that would anger me. To me, I felt that all of them should treat us with basic modicum of respect at least. We were the gatekeepers over their lives, if you think about it. Many of us had nothing to lose. They had families they could go home to every night. If we ever got pushed to our limits, we can make sure we can interrupt all of that. Many of the correctional staff didn't seem to realize that by how they indiscriminately treated us as if we were all the same. I had gotten tired of trying to be good, uh, 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 quote, unquote, and try to stay out of trouble. I was more than ready to start busting heads and taking names, no matter if it meant fucking the police up in there or prisoners who crossed the line too. I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna discriminate. When we heard everyone coming back in from wrecking her gangster brown cell door open, I stepped out the cell, leaving Buddy and CC inside. I told them I would post up at the table in front of his cell and wait for, uh, wait for them. It was obvious that we, we were up to something because Gangster Brown was on guard immediately. His cell door was wide open, something he never did. I saw him tighten up his laces on his boots and belt around his waist. He definitely knew that we were about to come at him. I really didn't care though. I was just wondering how, I was just wondering what was taking Buddy and CC so long to come out of the cell. I wasn't trying to jump him in the day room and get caught, but he left no other option. Not on, not too long after I posted up at the metal chill hall food bench, he exited his cell and started to approach me. I was on the other side of the metal table with one of my shoes on the stool and the other on the ground. Uh, you can take up from there, Shamako. Shamako, are you gonna read or? Uh... I am. Okay, go ahead. <clears throat> Now I'm all lost. Well, it starts with, you got something on your mind, youngster? All right, there we go. Hold on, I'm almost back there. There you go. <clears throat> He's popping past it. You got something on your mind, youngster? He said, coming out of his cell. I didn't say anything. I just kept shifting my eyes from him to myself, waiting on Buddy or CC to exit. No sooner than he said that, Gangster Brown began making his way towards me. As he walked around the table with his back to myself, I rose up from my position and got on guard. I remember thinking to myself, if somebody doesn't come out and help me soon, this is gonna be a big problem for me to have to tackle by myself. But he must have been reading my mind because he came out the cell and hurriedly ran over to where he and Gangster Brown were. Jumping on the table, Buddy Superman punched Gangster Brown right in the face as soon as he turned around. I quickly ran up to him grabbed him around the waist and brought my right leg around his, a classic takedown move that I had been accustomed to using to take people to the ground. One of the first lessons you learn when being jumped is to stay on your feet. Gangster Brown must have never gotten that memo from his life lessons. As soon as he hit the ground, we were on him. I figured mm. I would serve my, my purpose best by just holding him to the ground while Buddy and Cece went to work on his face and body. Excuse me. We hadn't planned to execute our plan in this fashion, but you don't always know how a fight will play out until you're in the midst of the commotion. I realized if he got up, we would have had a harder time fucking his ass up. So I sacrificed for the team and kept him to the ground with some of the wrestling techniques I had mastered in other fights I had gotten to over the years. I had always been a great wrestler in high school. The high school wrestling coach had wanted me to try out for the team. Freshman year, he had already decided I would be on the varsity team by the way I manhandled some of the heavier guys in my, my gym class. All of those techniques I had put to use as I heard Buddy and Cece raining down punches on him. Brown stood no chance to recover after I got him to the ground, and my guys were on him like a pack of wolves. I remember hearing their fists beat against his face as I maneuvered to get better leverage over him. I must say Buddy was the most active of the two. He applied nonstop aggression to his cranium. CC had delivered a few decisive blows and then he melted back into the crowd that was circling around us. We had the whole attention of the entire cell house. I think many people were glad that we were bringing our youthful justice to Gangster Brown. 
even though we weren't the underdogs in the force we brought, we were the executioners of the collective disdain that others had started to develop for this bully. Everyone lock up their cells, the pod officer said over the intercom. As quickly as it started, it was over. The response team entered the cell house nearly 10 deep. Buddy and I hit the floor and put our hands behind our backs so as not to get manhandled by him. Because CC got his punches in early and blended back into the crowd, they didn't bring him into the desegregation, deseg for short, until later that night. For a minute, we thought CC had gotten away. I'm not sure how they ended up finding out that CC was a part of it too. Most likely one of the other prisoners had snitched him out. By the time the night was over, all four of us, including Gangster Brown, were sitting on lockup away in the conduct adjustment board tab. Miller, the CO said, you're being moved to East Cell House. You're going to cell 412 on the left side. Okay. The conduct adjustment board found me and Buddy guilty of the class B write-up we were given. CC got found not guilty behind the incident. One of the correctional officers in F Cell House had written a statement for him. So he was sent back to F Cell House and given his job back. Gangster Brown had been found not guilty, but he was still transferred to G Cell House. Before we left DSEC, Gangster Brown had apologized to all of us for implying that Buddy had snitched on his last write-up. He admitted that he was wrong for that, didn't want any further problems out of us. I didn't realize how bad we had beaten him until I saw the huge black eye that had left one of his eyes shut closed. I knew once the others in prison population saw him, everyone would know that we were a clique that wasn't going to allow shit to slide if anybody disrespected us. We would retaliate and doing so with a vengeance. My new leaf had been turned. Several weeks after being moved to the left side of E's cell house, Buddy got moved to E as well. We picked right back up where we had left off. The difference now was that we had a reputation for being youngsters who would put in work if need be. I was initially cautious about how the GDs would feel about what he had done to one of their gang members, but all of them were cool with what we had done. Word got around that Gangster Brown had one of those types of cases that a lot of guys couldn't respect. Not sure how true it was because I never looked into it myself, but they said he had put a baby in a microwave and killed it. After I heard about that, I felt he should have been forced into protective custody units anyway and never been allowed in general population, especially walking around like he was big and bad. My first year in prison, I realized a lot of bullshit was allowed that I felt was unprincipled. Some of the weak snitches were set out and preyed upon, while the ones who would stab you up and would attempt to kill you were whispered about at best. I didn't feel the double standards I witnessed as time passed, but I also didn't feel it was my responsibility to rectify every situation I came across. So I had a policy of just cutting off those guys who fucked up shit in their past. The first couple of months in East Cell House, we went on lockdown several times. I didn't mind because I preferred being around prisoners were more rebellious against the correctional staff and didn't mind showing it. They would lock down for they would lock down us for every, they would lock down us for any and everything. They would use collective punishment to try to turn us against each other. But most of us saw through that shit. So anytime they locked us down, we just made the correctional officers work harder. Instead of throwing all our trash away when the guards came around to pick up trash, we would trash the unit by throwing all our trash out on the cuff porch into the day room area. The guards were so used to that, they would just go around picking up trash off the floor by the time their shift was over. Sometimes some of us would save our milks and when we felt they were good and spoiled, we would throw them out under the cup ports or under the day room too. By the end of the guard shift, the whole day room would reek with spoiled milk mixed with other smells. That was our whole collective punishment. And it often worked to our advantage because the guards would want the lockdown to end. So the prison workers could return to work and they wouldn't be forced to do anything, everything themselves. Pass. Uh, so, um, hi, I know, are, is he still in the room? Anybody else in the room would like to read? I can't, I can't read right now. Oh, uh, okay. Um, I'll take mm -hmm. uh, Okay, go ahead. I had a cool celly in EB, big L was from Fort Wayne. I think, and we got along fine, lockdown or no lockdown. Most of the times 
when they did lock up down, we uh, would still get visits. Having him for a celly worked out perfectly. I taught myself how to braid my own hair before coming to E, and Big L already knew how to braid himself. So we both agreed to do each other hair for free. The fact that I have done time in boys' school and a county jail, I had gotten used to other men braiding my hair without feeling uncomfortable about it. It was just a part of uh, doing time. Besides, I figure it will give me an opportunity to perfect my own skills. At the time, I could only plait my hair or put connects in them. I wanted to get good enough to even French braid my own hair. It will be years later before I would get to that point, but I eventually did. Braiding my own hair saved me a lot of money in prison because it made me self-reliant. There's nothing like being self-reliant, no matter if it's on an individual level or on a community level. As me and Big L demonstrated my exchange in our hair braiding services to help each other on a community level, we all have skills that can exchange to get our own communities to self-reliances as well. This was a lesson I first started to learn while serving time, but wouldn't be one I would easily forget. The summer of 2000, I played a lot more basketball out at Reg than I had done the previous year. East Cell House, had the best basketball team, and I wanted our team to beat them. So I practiced a lot. Anytime there was a pickup game going on, I would work on my game to prepare myself for them. They had a guy on their team by the name of LT. He could have easily gone to the, uh, a Division I college to play basketball. That's how good a lot of us thought he was. I remember... A number of times, little Kefty, who was their um, point guard and had a nice game himself, all fast break will give LT an alley hoop. The crowd will go wild on the sideline. Anytime they play, everyone on the yard will crowd around and watch them play. If I had to compare them to a college basketball team, I would have to say they play a lot like the Fab Five, which was my favorite Michigan Wolverine basketball squad. I forget which cell house we had played this particular day out at Reg, but I remember Commissionary was running around the same time as our basketball game. Right after our game ended, I hurriedly ran over to the building that handed out our commissionary every week. There was a pretty long line. By the time I received my bag and have gotten back to our cell house, me and one of the basketball team members noticed that everyone was locked in eight cells. We both asked the floor correctional officer if he minded if we took a quick shower since we were still sweaty from our basketball game. He told us that we could. I knew count time was in about an hour, so I hurried to my cell. As soon as I walked in my cell and threw my bags on the bed, the pod officer in a control area electronically started to roll my door shut. I snatched it back open before it could close. Looking up to the control pod, I yell, the floor officer told me that I could take a quick shower since we had a basketball game this morning. I knew he already knew that because he let my teammate back into his cell to get his shower stuff. He was already headed towards the shower. I figured that I told him that he was going to honor the floor officer by letting me get my shower as well. As soon as I went back, into my cell and start grabbing my shower stuff. So um, he electronically rolled my uh, cell door shut again. I was pissed. 
can you tell him to open my cell up so I can take my shower? I yell out for my uh, cuff port talking to, um, talking to the floor officer. Instead of rectifying the situation, he acted like he couldn't do anything. I need to talk to the sergeant, I bellowed. Again, instead of rectifying the situation with the control part officer, he simply acted like there was nothing he could do. I was seething uh, with uh, anger. As I paced back and forth in my cell, I told Big L how I was getting tired of how these guards would practically do what the F they wanted. No matter if we weren't in the wrong, they would show us time and time again that they would completely disregard our efforts to resolve any grievances we had. And that became all the move apparent when the sergeant came on the unit with the nurse. Sarge, I yelled through the cup port, I need to talk to you when you get a chance. He looked up at myself, but didn't even acknowledge me. All he had to do was say that he would come and see what the problem was after he finished walking around with the nurse to pass out medication. Instead, he didn't even acknowledge me. I tried to hold my anger in, but that pissed me off even more. According to Indiana Department of Correction, DOC policy and procedure, a prisoner had to attempt to resolve any grievances they had with the shift supervisor or officer in charge of the unit before filing a formal grievance. You want me to continue? Uh, I'll take over for a little. <clears throat> when I heard the main door open to the hallway and the sergeant start walking towards the exit without addressing my issue, I yelled out, Sergeant Ash, I, need, I said I needed to talk to you. I forgot what he said, <clears throat> but he walked off the unit without addressing my issue. I was boiling with anger. It didn't matter if we tried to follow their policies and procedures. I had witnessed for over a year how, that would how they would arbitrarily do what they wanted. And if they observed their fellow officers being vindictive or arbitrary, they would simply go along with them and try to justify their actions. I was getting tired of having to deal with that shit. After a while, you began to feel defeated and dehumanized. I had never been the type of person who would hold my tongue in relation to arbitrary authority too long before I took matters into my own hands. What the sergeant did next left me no other choice. I would say about 30 minutes or so had passed when I heard my cell, when I heard my door roll. They caught me off guard because I knew it was count time. Yo, what up, every... Marco? Uh, Pardon? Yeah. Uh, I hear voices. Do you want that was, me to? That was me. That was me. It was an accident. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I would say about 30 minutes or so passed when I heard my door roll. They caught me off guard because I knew it was count time and everything was supposed to be locked down during count time. When I walked to the door to see what was going on, Sergeant Ash appeared, standing right in my face, he growled. You don't tell me what to do. If I want to come up here and talk to you, I will. If I don't, I won't. I determine everything that goes on around here, not inmates. Wow. As we set down his own, as he set down his own rules and regulations, I smiled because I knew he had bought that bottle of beer. Oh. I was fed up with how arbitrary most of the prison staff were. I had heard them call dudes boys, and some of them even had white supremacist tattoos. Before I had arrived at that prison, I heard about one guard even hanging a noose from the control pod and hadn't been disciplined for it either. There was no question in my mind that I was dealing with many white people who thought they were superior to their black prison population. It wasn't always what they would say, but how they treated you and their tone towards you. They would normally talk to you in a very condescending manner. Most of the time I tried to avoid even having to deal with them because I knew I wasn't a turn the other cheek type of Negro. I was one of them, I will fuck you clean up field niggas. <laughs> 
By the time he finished telling me who the sheriff of this town was, I had already decided that I would set it off before the day was over. Many of us had been discussing our desire to fuck the guards up. I was at that point and beyond. I wanted to bust open some heads. I didn't care about the consequences any longer. I was ready to completely turn over a new leaf in my prison bed. Buddy must have read my mind because as soon as Sergeant Ash walked off the unit and the floor officer went into the hallway with him, he was stooping down at his cuff port uh, looking my way. I lipped to Buddy that we were gonna fuck up all the guards when, he, when we came out for lunch. Several other guys who had discussed with me their desire to fuck up the guards as well. I had sent them kites, a prison letter, outlining the same thing. Before the doors opened up for lunch, I told Big L how much it was a pleasure being his celly, and I wished him well if our paths didn't cross again. When our cell doors rolled for lunch, I headed downstairs as unsuspectingly as I could. I didn't want to tip the guards off. Sergeant Ash was standing by the opposite stairs in front of the chow hall mobile food carts. I headed towards the floor officer's area to grab my spoon like everyone else. None of the guards seemed to suspect anything. After grabbing my spoon, I approached the area where Sergeant Ash was standing. My right hand had been in my right pocket since leaving the cell. Now that I had gotten into swinging distance of the sergeant, I pulled my hand out, revealing the lock in a sock that was wrapped around my hand. I had caught him completely off guard swinging the lock in the sock at his head like Samson in the Bible, I tried to take him out with one blow. Boom. I hadn't planned on the lock busting through the sock I had put it in, but it did. Luckily, it hadn't hit any of the other prisoners standing in line. Instead, it crashed loudly against the side door leading to the other side of the cell house. For a split moment, I had paused in shock that the lock had busted right through the sock I had placed it in. I should have put it inside two socks instead of one, but I'd never hit someone in the head with a lock in a sock before, so I hadn't given the number of socks needed much thought. Undeterred, though, I remember Buddy coming from nowhere and hitting Sergeant Ash square in the face. He immediately dropped to the floor and covered up. But Buddy and I commenced to kicking him in the ribs and face repeatedly. The floor officer at one point tried to run up on us, but I acted like I was gonna go after him. So he retreated back to his floor podium. After he ran off, I continued kicking and punching Sergeant Ash. Uh, Kwame, you wanna read some more? Is Kwame still there? Yeah, uh, okay. You wanna take over? Yeah. Okay. All right, even though I was elated to finally be getting uh, be getting the year and a half of frustration out. I was wondering why some of the other prisoners wasn't busting the other guards head at least. Uh, other guards at least. I realized all of those other dudes were all tough. When it came down to it, they were really about, they weren't really about that life. What happened next really caught me off guard. I felt some, uh, someone grabbed me and tried to pull me off the sergeant. I thought one of the guards had sneaked through the side door and caught me off guard. But when I turned around and saw that it was another prisoner, a black one at that, I shook him off of me and squared up on him. I couldn't believe it. It was one of the guys I had first entered the prison with. He was from Naptown and, uh, and everything too. And here he was trying to save one of the guards. Some of the slave-minded shit I witnessed while I was in prison, I wouldn't have believed if I hadn't experienced it myself. I would disclose his name, but I'm hoping he has repented of his sins since then. The fact that this house nigga had distracted me, the other guard had gotten the opportunity to run up on Buddy and mace him. He maced him all in his face. Mind you, this guard was much bigger than Buddy and I, but when I acted like I was gonna jump on him for Mason, uh, my guy, he treated, retreated back to his podium again. Coward ass motherfucker. After his cowardly ass ran back off, I stopped, I st stooped down and began hitting Sergeant, uh, uh, Sergeant in his head with all my might. 
After the fifth or sixth blow, my pointer finger pushed back into my hand. The pain that shot through my shot through me made me halt my aggression instantly. No sooner than I had stopped my aggression, the response team was busting through the side door of the cell house. Everybody locked down, they said, barking out orders. I slowly down, lay down on my stomach as they, as they approached me. Buddy was still blinded by the mace, but he laid down and put his hands behind his back too. After they manacled my wrist and escorted me towards the exit, I said one final thing to the control pod officer who had initiated the unnecessary events that had followed. Looking up to him, to, uh, looking up to the control pod, I yelled, that was for you, chump. <laughs> wow. uh, that was wonderful to have your voice in there, Kwame. <laughs> Thank you very much. You really brought it alive. Well, now we're going to go into uh, having a little discussion about this uh, exciting chapter. Um, just to kind of lead off, I, I made a, just a couple notes and then we can take it from there. That, um, well, first of all, if we could discuss what the purpose of degrading and dehumanizing people is all about and how, how does disrespecting people affect them. Um, and maybe in this discussion, we could discuss like the whole tactic of divide and conquer that our rulers use uh, to keep us fighting each other. So um, with that, I'm going to open up for discussion. Would, uh, would anybody like to comment about how they were affected by this chapter and their thoughts? Well, um, I, let me tell you one thing that I heard about that I thought was real interesting about this divide and conquer business. And uh, I mean, it's not your story, Kwame, but have you ever heard of Reverend Pinckney? He, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, he got thrown. In, in I also Pinkney. was thinking of Reverend Pinckney. He went total bogus charges on him. I mean, you know, completely framed and everything. But he he wrote a book and he has a story where they needed to unite because they were getting, I think this was a story about this fish. The butt naked fish. Butt naked fish. It was horrible uh, shit that they were feeding people. And it was it was so bad. They, they all needed to come together, uh, you know, and uh, normally they, the different groups hated each other, Aryan brothers and various black gangs and uh, brown gangs, etc. But you know, Pinckney's always been about unity anyway, but he sees opportunity in this case to figure out how to get unity and what they needed. I mean, the fight that was just fought in this chapter is one type of fight, right? This maybe was another one, but he went to the Aryan Brotherhood <laughs> and, they, and this guy told him, he says, I hate niggers. And he said, well, I hate you too, but we got, <laughs> we need to, get together if we're going to solve this problem. And it, after that, I guess they became more tight with each other because they understood they did win. I don't remember the whole story. Maybe uh, Shimaka does. But it was a case where, you know, we could bridge some gaps. But anyway, anybody want to say anything about what happened in here? I mean, I think there was a lot of lessons. Okay, I'll take. Yeah, um, yeah go ahead. Here. I'll find um, you have to have a strong mindset when you enter a new type of environment that is more control. And I have to praise uh, Brother Kwame for um, be able to be strong while he endure racism, slavery, and um, freedom. And when we speak about freedom, um, I think of what Nelson um, Mandela had quote um, has said as a quote, for to be free is not merely to cast off one chains, but to live in a way that respect and enhance the freedoms of others. And I feel that who is in prison should not be the type, be in a situation where you lock the key and you throw it away, because there are people who are sent to jail or sent to prison because of life condition, or they are wrongfully 
being um, incarcerated because of their political action as well as their belief, which we have um, our Panther brothers and sisters that's in there, which I like to briefly mention, um, like Mamua uh, Abu Jaba Mal, who was recently released due to his medical condition. That was um, uh, Matulu Shakur. Right. Jamal um, Abdullah Al Amin, better known as um, H. Rap Brown, um, where there are also 75 people, 14 were um, members of the Black Panther Party who are locked up because of their political belief. Jali uh, Matagrim, uh, whose government name is Anthony um, Bottom, um, who was a former Black Panther and a Black Liberation um, Army member. And he spent 47 years in prison. Uh, Romain Chip. Fitzgerald, who've been locked up for half of a century, and the oldest Panther um, is uh, Sadiata Akuli, if I uh, pronounce his name correctly, correctly, where he's 84 years old, and he'd been in prison nearly half of a century. Um, he was eligible for parole three decades, where his parole had, bid had been denied. Um, last February, and most likely he would not live to appear before the board again. So we have- uh, He was at... released though. Uh, oh, he so was- Yada Akoli was, uh, re was released last year. He was, okay. Yeah. All right, well, all right. They didn't update it. When I looked at it, this information wasn't updated and I apologize for that. But we have to just look at the condition and also, because of the fact that people are in prison, does that deny them of their medical condition being treated? And uh, it seems like people that are in prisons are in prison and in private institution where their medical condition, it, they only get the minimum standard of health. And um, I find that it's a form of human rights violation where, um, it's something that I feel for the people like us that's on the outside, we need to rally and protest against and revise the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment. Because people believe that slavery doesn't exist when it's still in an existence. And um, it seems like there are more private prisoners, prisons, that getting more money to incarcerate people than people who are homeless, which is what to house a homeless person is $12,000. College is less, but I have like, whew, I have a statistic of how many people that's in prison and how much it costs the state. And uh, I just wanna briefly say in Illinois, there's a total of 47,622 prison, which the state um, paid to, to, to maintain prisoners are $1,595,647,075. And in Indiana, I looked that up and it was $28,656, I mean, excuse me, prisoners that's incarcerated, where um, it costs $517,000, oh, uh, excuse me, $517,678,909. And can y'all guess exactly what state had the highest number of prisoners? California, probably. Mississippi? <laughs> nope. Anybody else? Illinois? I, I thought California. Texas. Probably Texas. Texas. Yes, of course. I just read that, damn it. Mm -hmm. yeah. let, me, let me tell you, 149,159, where the amount is 
$3,213,997. And I want to add that the USA had the highest incarceration rate in the world, five to 10 times higher than Canada, France, and the United Kingdom, and Black men are six times more likely than white men to be incarcerated. So again, it just comes down to the quote that Nelson Mandela has said, for to be free is not merely to cast off one chain, but to live in a way that respect enhances the freedoms of others. Because those who are incarcerated, who lose their freedom behind these private, prioritized prison shows a reflection that we are not free anywhere. That's right. By the control of money. So I just want to bring that out. Well, to thank, thank you very much because that does yeah. set, set the proper picture on things. One, mm -hmm. of the, one of the things that struck me too was like, I know Kwame, you had said before that the, your story of prison was like a microcosm of society. And I was looking at that in terms of the whole society because what is, what is free, right? I mean, what, what kind of freedom when you are gonna be beat or chased in an alley, shot down, murdered, uh, you know, any kind of a reason to uh, put you away, you know, the whole prison, uh, the school, the prison pipeline that youngsters are involved in. I mean, I, I was getting off of work one day and there's a high school not too far uh, from my bus stop. And when I got there, the cops had a circle of girls and they were mostly black and brown girls, but they all had them handcuffed. They were little teenagers, you know, 14, 15 years old and they were all handcuffed. And I said, what have they done? And he said, oh, nothing, don't worry about it, just go away. <laughs> and it, it, what it was is his way of controlling the situation. He, he decided there was something looked out of control for him for a moment. And so he had all these girls handcuffed and put in a circle. They hadn't done anything, but it was his right to go and do this. And, you know, I mean, things like what was in this story, but also to see something like that on the street, they are scared. They are so cowardly and chicken. What are they protecting? See, that's, that's what I ask myself. What are they protecting? Uh, I mean, they're protecting the rights of private property of the capitalist system to keep everything together, keep it the way it is, keep the ruling class in power and keep those people who need to be ruled down. And that's why I was thinking some of the stuff that was in the prison, the dehumanizing, the guards are doing their job. They might have violated this policy, that policy, but their main job is to keep you down, to keep uh -huh. you in control. Uh, so uh, does someone else want to speak? Um, yeah. Yeah, I'd like to jump in on this. Oh, uh, hi, go ahead, hi. And listening to, uh, you know, the, the reading, uh, it just reminds me of a, I guess an, an analogy, analogy of, you know, like the community. If you're in a poor community, uh, you know you're confined, and it's almost like a prison because, yes. you know, you have the pigs out there <laughs> trying to keep you down all the time, and every time you, you get you get up, they beat you down again. Uh -huh. The thing about prison is you know, you're just confined to a much smaller area and, and they try to control you, control you. And I think what Kwame was doing was saying, you know, fuck you, you ain't gonna control me anymore because I've been controlled all my life, you know? And and I just ain't gonna do it anymore. So, you know, what what kind of a person am I if I go sit here and take this shit, you know what I mean? So that's the way that I see it. Uh, and and it's 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 that way in the poor neighborhoods, you know. It's it's that way in the in, in the prisons, and it's the poor neighborhoods that go to jail, you know. So you got people out in the suburbs and the big neighbor, rich neighborhoods, you know, they can go anywhere they want, but you you can't go if you're if you're from a poor neighborhood into any of those other neighborhoods because you could end up in jail. So, mm -hmm. and they control you, you know, by 
uh, dehumanizing, same thing. You know, physical violence, same thing. And it don't make any difference uh, what, you know, uh, what age you are, what sex you are, you know, they're, they're going to beat you down. And, and I've, you know, I saw that in uptown Chicago and I've seen it in every neighborhood around that I've been into. And even here in, you know, in Huntsville, Alabama, of course, mm -hmm. you know, they do their best to beat you down. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and right. so, you know, that was a good chapter. I really enjoyed that, Kalani. Yeah, yeah. I, I love the fighting spirit in there, you know, like all of us have yearned to be able to get our, our own hand back in these situations because I don't know I mean I've been humiliated ever since I was a kid I mean I was a, humiliated by a authoritarian father that beat the shit out of me all the time I was humiliated in school by teachers I was humiliated on all my jobs almost, almost all my jobs I mean I finally got a job I've been in this one job now I'm still working at 76 right and <laughs> I, I've been working there almost 16 years and I get along pretty good with the boss. He's a pastor. We, at first we had a little fight and I won and he let, you know, he re let me stay. So we've been hobbling along. Okay. Well, we get this woman, she's a vicar. She comes in like she's so uh, uh, above me, you know, and starts humiliating me. And I didn't, I wouldn't put up with it. I was like, fuck this shit. I'm too old for this shit. And I mean, I could just see how you come, you come to this sometimes, you don't care anymore. Saw a young woman in the Walgreens yesterday who came to that, you know, customer, you bought that bottle of beer, damn it. Oh, no. She had had it. I mean, they thought they could fuck with her. And she's like, this job not worth it she said for me to put up with this shit and uh -huh. you know she didn't care who heard her and and this is how i see things you know like they they talk about how nobody wants to work even i hear workers say that nobody wants to work and oh, there's too much free money out there people say, i'm like what free money you know show me the line because i want some of that free money but it's not that people don't want to work i mean at a certain time you're not making enough to go to work, you know, I mean, we're, we're, we're slaves out here, you know, that's the thing, we're not, we're not, we're not slaves, like just getting room and board, we're slaves that yeah. get some money, and then we got to go pay for our room and board, which, you know, I'll show you people in Humble Park living in tents right now, who are working, I'm not everybody, but some of them are working, they cannot afford to pay the rent, Okay. So anyway, um, and that, and I agree with you. Yeah. It's like you um, are you living to work to work yeah. to die, you know. And um, it just shows that everybody have their limitation. And yeah. I remember reading that uh, the definition, but the history about rednecks, and it gave me a new light about not only the term but exactly what they had to endure because these are. Mm -hmm coal miners who lived out in West Virginia, and they were subjected to also the most cruise type of uh, work condition yeah. where they were in, um, uh, you know, mines for hours on end and come out looking black. And um, they, weren't yeah. paid, they weren't paid well at all. And uh, employers had so much govern over their lives until they don't pay them with money or, or any kind of currency, but the currency was scripts that they give them. They had a certain type of living space that their employers set for them. And, um, you know, when someone says, I'm a redneck, but people don't realize there's different type of rednecks. There's white rednecks, yellow rednecks, and there's even black rednecks. Okay, <laughs> there's different kind of rednecks, but I, uh, I was just so taken away with the way that corporation have so much control over people lives, it just seems like it's something where we headed now, as we approach this upcoming new digital currency system. And I just want to say, um, again, how much can you tolerate? Yeah. And there's so much 
you know, as people that we will tolerate where we just don't care how, how worse can anything get, you know, from the unwarranted beating, the destructions of personal property, physical abuse, mental torture, that I'm sure a, a lot of Black indigent people, um, people of lower class had endured. And I just want to add, when I did a little bit of research, that the United States, the only democracy in the world that has no independent authority to monitor prison conditions and mm. uh, enforce minimum standards of health and safety, where um, in total amount, um, there are 1,288,813 prisoners in total. And to house a prisoner is 42 trillion Eight hundred and three million five hundred thirty-seven thousand five hundred and ninety dollars that cost the whole United States, mm -hmm. and um, I feel um, to be in in a place called correctional center or, or environment. What is correction of, behind that? As you mentioned, and everyone has said so wonderfully. How can you um, state anything about correction when all of these crimes are even taking place and violations are being taking place where um, it's okay, where it's not okay? So my question to Brother Kwame, uh, with all of this that have taken place while you was in prison, um, did your lodge a, a grievance committee um, put it, uh, submit it to the board, or what could y'all do to further your fight for human rights while you was in prison? Uh, they, they, they got a grievance process, if you want to call that, <laughs> but it's kind of like the police investigating the police, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so most of the times, like I was talking about in there, like, uh, uh, I, I, I didn't talk about the grievances that I had failed during that time but uh during the 18 years i was in prison i probably only won a handful of grievances <laughs> and wow. some grievances that i won it was like uh it was clear in a policy uh but they didn't uh rectify the situation to like three months after the fact so my human rights and uh violations had been violated for three months but y'all knew it was being violated for those entire three months. So uh, it's kind of really a joke in prison. Uh, that's why you got situations like me being a young dude coming in prison with 39 years. And after one year, I'm already busting one of the CO's heads because I realized it's no, there's no rectification to nothing. No matter if we filed grievances, no yeah. matter if we talked to the sergeant, no matter what we do, it's always the same outcome. And right. when you have a young kid, especially like I was, I was only like, what, 21 or something at this time? Uh, yeah, like 21. Uh, like, and you telling me I gotta do my life over in prison? After a while, I'm gonna figure out there's nothing that's gonna be able to resolve my grievance. So I'm gonna be the enforcer of my grievances and set an example for these pigs to recognize, look, Y'all not going to treat me this way. You know what I mean? You're not going to treat my guy buddy this way and any of the other prisoners stand up. So I start recognizing, honestly, that was really where I got a lot of my uh, uh, deference from the COs where they, uh, they did, uh, after a while, they, they, they started to be, and, and this was always a constant struggle, but they they started to treat me a little different because they realized like yeah I was one of them uh, uh, prisoners that will uh, retaliate and I would do so with a vengeance. You know what I'm saying? I wouldn't. It wouldn't be no real like uh, pat on your ass. Like I'm going like that. Co right there got his ribs broken. You know what I'm saying? And he right. he retired uh, what a month or two after that. So I got my justice. You know what I'm saying? He's yeah. no longer a prisoner uh, in, in uh, a guard <laughs> in uh, prison in Indiana. Mm -hmm. So that was how I, I started taking care of all my situations. I, I realized I was in modern day slavery. 
all yeah. the way across the board. Yeah. So it was just like, for me, part of the slave revolts that went on back then. You dig what I'm saying? Yeah. So um, yeah, the grievance process is ridiculous. I know Shamako got his hands up. So I would just say this, one thing I would want to point out is uh, how I explain like just the same stuff that goes on out here in society <laughs> goes on in there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and that's the crazy good. thing about it. Like a lot of people were sent, a lot of people in prison today is in there for uh, the war on drugs. But as you see, when you get in prison, nothing has changed. You know what I'm saying? Like if you was a dope dealer out here, you was a dope dealer out there, uh, in there. If you was a drug addict in, uh, out here, you was a drug addict out uh, in prison. So what does this really have anything to do with a war on drugs? It's really not. That's why I love mm -hmm. Michelle Alexander's book, yeah. The New Jim Crow, because she said this is not about rehabilitation. It's about social control and controlling different ethnic groups. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. And that's why we have so many br uh, black and brown uh, people in prison. You know what I'm saying? That's why you have lower class people in prison. I only came across one rich person. When I say rich, <laughs> I'm not talking about drug dealing rich. I'm talking about a person that uh, was like a uh, Bernie Madoff. I only came across one person like that in prison out of all them 18 years I was in prison. So I realized wow. this was a war on impoverished people as well it was a part of a class struggle uh even when we got when i got in there like how i showed how they divide the sale houses and um up as the good sale houses <laughs> and yeah. the bad sale houses and stuff but this was all a, a form of uh divide and conquer uh of creating social uh classes even inside prison you know what I'm saying? And prison is a microcosm of society. This is how they control us. They have to find ways to give certain uh, people privileges over other ones. And for those individuals to internalize that as if they're somehow better than the ones that is not in their privilege. You know, but we're in prison. Think about that. We are all in prison, but some of us was like, oh, <laughs> We're we're better off than E sale house and G yeah, sale yeah, house. Yeah. I would never want to go to that uh uh sale house. You know what I mean? Or it's kind of like how people be thinking out here. I would never want to live in that community, that ghetto. You know what I'm saying? It's like we divide the people amongst ourselves and don't realize like we under the same conditions. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Right. So one by the time I start reading books, my class consciousness was already being shown to me throughout my life experiences and prison was one of the ones that first opened up my eyes and see this is really what's going on on the outside, but people <laughs> don't see it as clearly because they can pick their slave masters now. You know what I'm saying? They can Absolutely. pick the areas uh, that they live in and to some extent, to some extent, you can't, you if you, if you don't have enough money to live in the suburbs, you're not gonna be out there, but you can live and uh, pick the apartment, the projects, you know what I'm saying, that is still occupied by the same police force. You know what I'm saying? Right, right, right. Uh, so I, I, I wanted to make that clear to uh, people in there, like uh, the same stuff, I, and, I, and I leave this and let Shamako speak. Uh, I, I uh, tell people a lot of time, I didn't realize that I was always in a prison until I went to prison and yeah. got out and then I start to see the bars is out here. They just, <laughs> they just a lot more disguised and sophisticated out here. I realize like uh, I, I'm in a medium security prison now. You know what I'm saying? I and it's, it's ironic to me that a lot of people that that really talk about how free they is, and I'm like, well, you free, but you work two jobs. <laughs> that <laughs> you work two exactly jobs. Right. Yeah. You gotta ask someone for permission. So yeah, yeah like you working the same hours that our slave ancestors work and you're still on a treadmill mm -hmm. and you still have a hard time getting health care to take care of your meds and all this other stuff, but you free? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like yeah. people don't even see the bars out here and that's the ironic thing. You know what I'm saying? I had to go to prison to open my eyes so once I came back out, I could see the yeah. bars and the prison ways of wire fences and, and walls out here that other people just don't realize is right there and is confining their life. 
<laughs> Thank you. That's a really good point. Shimako, did, did you want to speak? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. All right. So so the first thing, um, so you bought the bottle of beer <laughs> at 1235. Right, I, I, I've been wanting to do that the whole call. <laughs> no, no. I bought the bottle of beer at 135. So, so, I don't know. <laughs> so I mean that's actually so I, I was in um I was in LA. I was in La Mirada. Um staying with my cousins when that uh when that movie came out and um you know in la at that time uh they used to hustle tapes off the lot so you know like like in the hood you'd end up getting like you could you, you know you they it was like fresh from the studio so it still had like the numbers the like take numbers on like the bottom of the video or whatever so you know when i when i went out to la that summer that was a, the Summer Minutes of Society release, and my cousin had a, a, a copy of that movie. And um, I, I, just, I remember that movie very fondly. And um, so when you, when you dropped a bottle of beer line, I was like, oh, a bottle of beer. Anyway, um, so I just wanted to share that. Uh, if, you have, if you haven't seen Minutes of Society, I highly recommend it. Um, so drugs and addicted to prison. So funny story about that. Um, so... Um, I haven't had to do like hard time or whatever, but I've definitely been to jail. And um, so one time I went to jail and it was in, um, I was in a county in San Jose and they placed me in my barrack. And I was in, my, I, like, I literally walked into my barrack and I ran into somebody I knew and they were, and they basically offered me alcohol and drugs like as soon as I got in there. <laughs> and, you know, at, the, at that time I was sober uh, but my bunkmate was actually on meth. So, like, in the first hour that I was there, there was alcohol, weed, and meth. And that was, that was, you know what I mean? That was just, you know, and no, and nobody was tripping. There were cigarettes, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. and it's, it's, it's funny, man. It's, you know, it's, I mean, to the, to the point that it's just like it is on the outside, it's an economy. Like the economy, the economy doesn't stop just because it's it's jail, and and the reality is that the people who run the jails know it and are participants in said economy. That's the bottom line. Like the economy doesn't stop just because the walls are there. You know what I mean? Um, in fact, the walls are just another part of the economy. <laughs> you, know what I'm so, uh -huh. you know what I mean? It's all it's all it's all money across the board anyway. Um, and, right. Uh, I also the um, it's interesting, like the social power of violence. Uh, and it's I don't know. I, I want to say it's unfortunate, but I'm hard headed, and sometimes I require forms of violence to understand things, so I get it. But it's all it is, you know, like you you know you wish that like people just would would understand. But you know, I've like I've been in situations. Where like I didn't want to fight somebody, and then I was forced to fight somebody, and then like they apologize, and it's like why couldn't you just apologize <laughs> you before I punch you? you know what I'm like why did we have to get to punching for their for an apology to be necessary? But you know, it, and it's unfortunate, right? Because you know, taken to a larger scale, what does that mean about human liberation? you know yeah yeah um and it's i i, I hate looking at that man i mean the uh it hurts my heart um i mean it is it is what it is but if that doesn't mean that that's you know what i want it to be or what we want it to be um right. and then you know sort of the last thing is uh this piece on uh dehumanization which i you know i think is is a very powerful and important because yeah. sort of, and, and Leslie, you, you sort of referenced this, right? Yes. yes. It really, it's, it's really the, it's like the breaking of the human spirit. Yes. Yes. I mean, because the, the human spirit, I mean, the spirit in general is a real thing. You talk about animals, right. And like, um, like the spirit of a horse, right. Yeah. Or, or like, yeah. or like the spirit of, um, of a dog that you're training. Right. Right. Or, or like, or like, you know, I mean, the, 
spirit is a real thing in in living th- even plants. <laughs> you know what I mean? Spirit is a living thing where spirit can be found wherever life can be found. And you know, really, the de- dehumanization is like it's like a, um, it's like a form of killing somebody, right? It's 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 a form of killing the spirit. Yeah. It's, it's, spiritual murder you know um and you know it's again it's kind of one of those things where it's like you know you get you get maybe to the maybe to the bottom of the totem pole or whatever and you know somebody might just be like involved in peer pressure right like you know i I mean i don't know i'm going to speak for anybody but i i know i know i know a lot of people self-included who have been involved in situations of like bullying or um you know, maybe just being mean to somebody yeah. that they didn't really need to be mean to because everybody else is being mean to them. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But right. you start getting to like the higher levels of things. And yeah, that's absolutely intentional. Like there's like there's no way you can structure an entire system. I mean, just like Kwame, like you were talking about, right? Like there's no way you can violate somebody's human rights for three months mm-hmm. on the basis of a policy you created. Right. And not know what you're doing. <laughs> you know what I'm like, mm-hmm. like there's just no way that you can't know. You know what I mean? And you know, again, it's kind of like, um, so yeah, you know, kudos, like props to you for keeping the spirit, for keeping your spirit, right? During that, during that period, and for anyone who can, but specifically you in this particular instance. Um, but yeah, I mean, dehumanization really is, you know, like let's say, like it's uh um, you know, trying to turn a uh, man into an animal. I would, I would go further. It's really, it's really trying to turn a human into an object, like not even an animal, but an, a, a lifeless, yeah. a, an, an yeah. automaton, a robot. Right. Mm-hmm. You know that that doesn't have any life. Uh, pass. Okay. Um, I think we might want to start wrapping up. I, I just want to p- make a point, and then anybody else can make a final point too. That um, when you look at our rulers in this society, they're the biggest criminals around, they, and they're never punished. They don't go to prison for their crimes. I mean, you hear about a, a uh, what's his name, Madoff, right, or something like that. <laughs> but I'm talking about. Trump, and I'm talking about Biden, talking about the Bushes, I'm talking about the Clintons. These people are the biggest uh, criminals, biggest criminals on the planet. I mean, they're responsible for for wars and murders and poverty, uh, destitution. All the people in Congress uh, either passing laws that, you know, fuck the rest of us over or, you know, whatever they do is... um, Sorry for using the F word there. (laughs) Um, But, but, you know, you get my point that what we're seeing here at the bottom, it's not about breaking laws. I swear to God, it's not about breaking the law. I mean, that's the excuse. You did this, you robbed a bank, you did this, uh, maybe you didn't do nothing. It's just about control, which is what we have been talking about. And this dehumanizing killing of the human spirit beat us down, right, to the level. Like if you look at like the way they try to condition a soldier, you know, to go fight, say, I mean, I heard it from a lot of Vietnam vets because that was my era. And they dehumanize the soldier down to the point where he's not a person anymore. He's just a tool. So a lot of those guys would say, I held the gun, Uncle Sam pulled the trigger. Mm -hmm. And that's the way I, you know, kind of characterizes what's happening. Our society is falling apart. Our young people are in trouble and their lives are a mess. D- dysfunction is rampant in families. I mean, I'll tell you, fights in my building <laughs> every other day, right? People exploding with each other. And we cannot zero in on them and go, well, we got to fix them or they need rehabilitation. I mean, I'm not saying people shouldn't get help if they can get help for their problems. But this main thing is the society we live in and how they are going about with their vice grip. 
on our necks to keep us in line. My grandson, he's just 22, and he was telling me one day, he said, I finally figured it out, Grandma, that everything, there's these powerful people up on top. And then they give a little bit to some people underneath them. And then some people underneath them. It's what you were saying, Kwame, about how some people get elevated. And then this is how they control. This is the basis of how they have controlled us. That's why when you see that bribe get taken away, especially towards white workers, let's face it, they had it pretty good for a while. And now they're beginning to suffer and walk the streets. And they, they don't want it the way it is, but they're too ignorant, some of them, to know what to do about it. And that's where we come in. Because right. we're the ones getting the class consciousness. We're the ones that are trying to be, raise above mm -hmm. this fray out here and say, how can we organize our class to do what it has to do mm -hmm. to be free? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I will, uh, my closing thing, I will piggyback uh, off of your first comment first, uh, that they're the biggest criminals. Yeah. Uh, I went to prison for robbing a bank. They, the government, they never held accountable for robbing whole countries of their resources. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, Wait, banks they, aren't held accountable for uh, Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Because they're they're a part of the robbery, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, of of being able to take over resources in these countries, we we all know uh, like a lot of these uh, wars is involved uh, oil, but it's also involved uh, uh, stuff that goes into uh, yeah. that is the reason why America is a rich country like it is. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you you've had uh, corporations that advocated and pushed for uh, coup d'etats and stuff. Like we all know about, uh, what's that country down there? And uh, it was just on the tip of my, uh, it start with a G. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, Grenada. Oh yeah, Grenada, yeah, Grenada. yeah. Grenada, wasn't that the, uh, that banana company that uh, working with the CIA? Uh, I'm going off the top of my head right now cause I haven't quoted this, but it was like in 1954 or something like that when they, uh, they pushed to overthrow that uh, government and uh, carry out a coup. You know what I mean? But these are not criminal <laughs> to, to this type of system. We we are only, a lot of us at the bottom are only an internalization of that same culture reverted on its head. And this is how we get a part of the black market. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But it's all a part of the capitalist market no matter if illegitimate yeah. capitalism or legitimate capitalism. You know what I'm saying? It's all a way to survive uh, 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 for us at the bottom. But as for them, it's about uh, extending their imperialist hegemony and control over the world, over this entire monopoly board. So a lot of this criminal culture is really a reflection of the ones at the top. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yes, uh, absolutely. Yeah, we, we actually are resembling their culture. While yes. they condemn us, they really condemn themselves and they're really legitimizing our class analysis of them being illegitimate society. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. If we think about it uh, to uh, very deeply. But one thing I wanna add, uh, the last thing I wanna add is that, uh, the reason why we have so many the divisions, uh, not only within prison, but out here, is because one of the key things that they always want to keep us distracted from recognizing that at the end of the day, the people really have all the power. But as long as they're not aware of that, right. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. We actually, if we was united, we already would be in power and this would be a different world that we have mm -hmm. now. But they have specialized in uh, social control, population control, different divide and conquer techniques that keep us blinded from our true power. You know what I'm saying? Because once we say, hey, we're tired and we're done with this and we recognize this system is illegitimate and that the people has to unite against this, you will see this uh, this system crumble very quickly. 
You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And that's why they keep us distracted on superficial things. Like we're always uh, uh, distracted by uh, the social media now uh, days. We're distracted yeah. by video games. We're distracted by drugs that that we consume to numb us to our reality. We distracted by racial uh, 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 the the melon or lack of melanin in a person, <laughs> uh, racism. You know what I'm saying? Sexism, yeah. uh, uh, xenophobia. If you're from a different country and you're 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 not one of us, you know what I'm saying? All of these are the ways that they keep us the uh hidden, uh uh distracted from the uh recognition that we actually have the power. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> this is something that generations when when the revolution succeeds, generations is gonna look back on our society and be like, wow, how did our ancestors not realize <laughs> like they actually were the ones that controlled their own destiny? Yeah. They either give it up, relinquish it, you know what I'm saying? Or they uh, assume their destiny, take the uh, reins of power of their class and carry it out to transform society and their interests. Like, like we all are more class conscious only because we did a lot of investigation, social analysis, reading, educating ourselves. But a lot of us, this was hidden from us. That's why Lennon said uh, this class consciousness has to be given to the people outside of the system. You know yeah. what I'm saying? The system is never going to give it to us. That's you know, they're going to keep us plugged into the matrix. But I think that's going to be an interesting thing that future generations is going to look at our generations and be like, wow, this is crazy. <laughs> like, y'all went through that for hundreds of years and didn't even realize that y'all could have changed this a long time ago. Long time. You know what I mean? Yes, That's indeed. probably one of the ironies of history. It's just like when we look at in the past of people, when we thought that it was demons and ghosts that was a result of the bubonic plague and stuff <laughs> instead of viruses and germs or or yeah. or condemning wit women as witches and stuff like this, or the earth was flat, you know what I mean? Like we look at those generations as like, how could people ever thought like that? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But future generations gonna look at us and be like, hey, <laughs> I'm glad y'all finally realized it at some point or we wouldn't even be here uh, in this society that y'all could have been living under a long time ago. So we have to keep that in mind is that's the key to how th that's the reason why they keep us divided. That's why they do these population controls. Prison is nothing but a counterinsurgency against the people uh, uh, rising up. It's a class mm. uh, form of class warfare. It has nothing to do with rehabilitation. It has nothing to do with trying to make us uh, uh, be adaptive to society and be good citizens. None of those things, as you as I explained in this chapter, I try to make bear the facts that everything that's going on out here is going on in there. There is no real differences. I saw more drugs, and this is ironic because <laughs> I used to be a stick-up man, but I saw more drugs in prison than I did out here. You dig know what I'm saying? I was introduced to doing different drugs that I never was introduced to out here. You know what I mean? So it's actually more concentrated in there and mm -hmm. uh well I, I, I just thought about this the last point i want to make uh both um i want to say leslie and uh shimako made this point uh the dehumanization process you know what i'm saying a lot of people don't understand this i realize sociopathology is when a person when your empathy is conditioned out of you you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people don't understand that these prisons are creating sociopaths. They're taking the empathy out of people. You know what I'm saying? Where, uh, and, and ones out here when the, in the 90s, they kept on saying, we need to be tougher on crime. We need to start giving longer prison sentences. We need to expand the, uh, the, the prison incarceration. You know what I'm saying? But mm -hmm. y'all, a lot of people out here don't realize like y'all creating the monsters that's coming back out to society and people don't realize all these murders that's, that's happening where they're killing up the women, the kids, that they, they even killed the pet hamster. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, it's because like once people went through that process and they yeah. come out here, there's no life in them no more. 
Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I've seen that time and time again in there where people, when we first started our time off, you still saw humanity. But they conditioned and beaten and dehumanized us so much that a lot of ones became real sociopaths where they don't have no empathy no more. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And this is another reason why we, the prison liberation movement is so necessary because if it wasn't for books and me educating myself, I could have came out here just like that. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And we, can, we, we cannot fail to help these brothers and sisters and their change their their analysis of their self and, and society where they can be contributors of the revolution. But as of right now, the war on drugs, I mean, this uh, uh, the the infl- uh, the inundation of drugs in prison is way worse now than it was when I was in there. Because I get prison phone calls all the time and people tell me, bro, everybody's strung out here in here now, bro. Like everybody is hooked on. Think about this, when COVID was going on, and they shut down and p- people couldn't get uh, uh, visits. It was more more overdoses in prison at that time. How, how was the drugs getting in there? This is part of the design. This is chemical warfare being, this is a weapon of mass destruction they're unleashing yeah. against our community. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah, and yeah. I want people to take that lesson <laughs> away and understand <laughs> our brothers and sisters in prison, we can't forget about them. We have to develop our movement up enough where we can support the liberation movement in there because they're in their banning books that I read to help me. Yeah. Those yeah, yeah. books are banned. You know what I'm saying? You can't yeah. read books about the Black Panther Party in one place. And I talk about this. You couldn't even read any books about Martin Luther King. They banned Martin Luther King books. My <laughs> book was banned. My autobiography that the, we're reading now to educate people about what's really going on was banned after three weeks of publication. So they're trying to take away that is even a lifeline to help people to uh, be able to fortify their mind to endure that. You know right. what I mean? Right, right. Well, thank you. Uh, that was a great sum up. And um, <clears throat> I, I, is it OK if we start closing? Shimako, did you want to say a few words or shall we proceed? To oh, no, no, we're good. I'm good. I'm good. OK. Y- yes, hon? Uh, uh, do y'all mind if we take a group picture or y'all just want to pass that oh well i know i was going to do the game now oh okay Can we, i mean unless you want to take a picture first i don't know yeah. I'm, not sure, I'm not sure how we do that uh, I'll, I'll take it uh brother shamarco okay. can you turn on your camera and everybody else for a group picture Everybody turn their ca- hey, there he is. Okay. Uh no, I don't see I see his hands up. There he is. Okay, Shimako, come on into the picture, hun. We're gonna Okay, we're gonna, hi, we're, brother we're Dominic. I'm I'm not in a position where I can use my camera right now. Okay. Okay. All right. How about brother that Di- okay? There he is. Hold on. I'm gonna take two pictures because my I got an Android. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um brother. Diamond, I'm gonna take a picture of you. Hold on. All right. And let me just go back to the screen. Okay. And I'm gonna take a picture of me, Brother Kwame, and Queen Leslie. You ready? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. All, All right. right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, look, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna play a little game now that Sister Anna started last week, and you're going to tell me if you can see this. <clears throat> okay. Oh, I, we could use whiteboard. I know. I got it. I oh, didn't, okay. I'll tell you what. I, I didn't think you guys were ever going to get this, but now I think you will. Hold on a second. Oh, before I give it to you, there's the prize is going to be I got this book here. Uh, you can't see it's Common Sense too. Um, a guy named Thomas Paine, you might be aware of if you remember your history, he wrote Common Sense, yeah. which was a book that was against the monarchy. It helped, it helped organize the uh, work, you know, really the working class in this country to fight for independence from the king. Well, this kid, this young man, he's a teacher. He's in our committee here in Chicago. 
he wrote Common Sense too, and he signed it Samuel Payne. Now he's Sammy, but he ain't Payne. <laughs> but it's a cool little book. And you'll send me, if you send me where to send it, I will send you a copy of this book. Oh, if, if you can guess. Now, first we gotta see, let's see. Can you all see the whole thing? Um, no, I can't expand it. Okay, this is- How many letters? One, two, three, four, five, six letters on the first one. One, two, three, four letters. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, one, two, three, four. I gave so you I gave you vowels. I gave you O, U, I gave you an A, I gave you an O and an O. So I gave bring, you bring it closer. Bring it closer. All right. I gave you all the O's, all, all the U's, and all the A's. So it's bump, 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 bump. And it's in the chapter? It's in the chapter, and we said it many times. If that'll help you. Mm. Guess guess a letter. Somebody guess guess what a letter, and if you get it, I'll put it in. B. Okay. <clears throat> that was a real good one. Let me because see. This one starts with B. That one starts with B. And that one starts with B. B O N is the B -O -U. first. B O U. B O U. Oh, B O U. And this is B, B O. And this one starts with B down here. I'll tell you what, I'll put the E's in. All right. Can't believe you guys aren't gonna get this. Now you're gonna get it. Come on. Oh boy. <laughs> the last word. B E E. Come on. Okay, what okay. Well, what's the bottom one? What's the bottom size? The bottom one is B E E, and there's another letter missing. So we said it many times in here. I'll give you another clue. Shimako spoke about it, about the movie. Come on. Oh, bought that bottle of beer. Yeah, bought that bottle, that bottle of, of beer. beer. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I thought for sure you got the money. I thought you would get it. I really did. I can't believe it because he Shimako talked about it so much. <laughs> right at the beginning. I, I, well, all okay. right, Kwame is the winner. Kwame's a winner. That's right. <laughs> So you can send me a where to send it, and I will send that off to you. Okay. Um, all right. I now, appreciate that. Now, I you get bragging rights, too, so we're going to brag about you all week long. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm going to brag about you. You could public, uh, will you publicize the bragging rights for him? Yes, you definitely. Know, because, because I think it, it was such a feature in this chapter. I don't know whether it ever comes up again, but to me, it's... <clears throat> Symbolize the chapter, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, dear. Okay. Now, Kwame, did you do you have a more current copy of the uh, Statement of Unity? Yeah. You want to go ahead and read that for us when we close out here? Okay. You want me to okay. do that now? Yeah, yeah. Do that now. Okay. And I think <laughs> next next week we're going to do Veronica's going to lead, right? Uh, yes, she's going to be the next moderator. I think you, um, you're not going to be in attendance. Do I, I have that correct? Yeah, I have to go out of town and help my okay. son out so, with the kids. Okay. So. All right, go ahead. All right, this is the Statement of Unity for the Second Rainbow Coalition. This is the preface I'm about to read right now. The U.S. was founded as a colonial settler state based upon white supremacy and slavery, still in the lands of the indigenous nations, breaking every treaty made with them and confining them to reservations, concentration camps. 
As the country became more powerful and the eagle sunk its claws into other nations, making war on Mexico and grabbing its northern territory, invading Cuba, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and the Philippines, and either annexing them outright or making them colonies or neo-colonies. And in the 20th century, it became the major imperialist power of the world, exploiting both the people within its borders and those in every other country bullying them with military interventions and robbing them of their right to self-determination. We have two enemies to fight, racism and capitalism. Between the two, capitalism is primary, racism is a byproduct of capitalism. We, uh, the working people of the world of every ethnicity or nationality face a common enemy that is destroying life on earth. Our enemy is a small, ruling class of property owners controlling most of the world's wealth and resources. We must have our basic needs met to live a good and meaningful life. Food, shelter, healthcare, education, freedom from oppression by the state and peace with other nations. To attain these essential things for life, we must have the power to see to it that the abundance that is available is shared equitably. The Statement of Unity for the Second Rainbow Coalition. The legacy of the first uh, Rainbow Coalition dates back to its founding on April 4th, 1969 by the original Black Panther Party, original Young Lords and Young Patriots organization. A number of other organizations joined this coalition not too long afterwards, such as the American Indian Movement, Brown Berets, Rising Up Angry, the Red Wars and others. Since the founding of the United States, the masses had developed a number of popular movements that came together to fight back against the capitalist imperialist system in various ways around particular demands. Nevertheless, none had established a movement quite like the first Rainbow Coalition. This historic movement was the first of its kind that established a model of class struggle like no other. Its charismatic leader, Chairman Fred Hampton of the Illinois uh, chapter of the original Black Panther Party stated that at the end of the day, we weren't engaged in a race struggle, he said that it's a class struggle, goddammit. By uniting with the various oppressed ethnicities and masses, they were able to bridge the gap between the various ethnic communities that white supremacy had long sought to keep divided. This class solidarity equipped them with the material basis and class consciousness to see their common class condition. Therefore, the necessity to form a united front against their common class oppressor, the capitalist imperialist ruling class. The ruling class viewed this as the greatest threat to their class rule and subsequently used the entire repressive forces of the state, police, courts, jails, prisons, and intelligent agencies, etc., in order to crush this emerging revolutionary socialist movement. We refounded the Rainbow Coalition on May 14, 2021, with the intent of upholding the legacy of the original Rainbow Coalition. We believe that this historic example is the model for the United Front that will best serve our class liberation. By upholding the 10 point program of the original Black Panther Party, which was subsequently adopted and later expanded by the original Young Lords, Young Patriots Organization and all other original Rainbow Coalition members, we established our programmatic unity. The six disciplinary rules that we uphold ties all organizations and our coalition to a common uh, professional discipline. History has bestowed upon our generation a common class mission to fulfill. The representatives of the capitalist and privileged ruling class represented by the Democratic Party and Republican Party cannot liberate us. It is their class intention and interest to uphold our common class oppression. Therefore, it is only we, the oppressed masses of all ethnicities and nationalities, who must build the necessary class solidarity, class consciousness, organizational structures, and a united front that will ultimately liberate ourselves. This is what the Second Rainbow Coalition is committed to. This is the historic mission we intend to fulfill. Dare to struggle, dare to win. All power to the people, boots on the ground. All the members of the coalition is the New African Black Panther Party, White Panther Party, Green Party of New Jersey, Poor People's Army, La Mesa Nacional de Brown Berets, Fury, uh, Nassau, New Era Young Lords, and Guardian Rebellion. The six rules of discipline is one, members uh, will conduct themselves in a manner to bring credit to the coalition and will treat others with respect and politeness. 
two, members will be sober when on Rainbow Coalition business and will not engage in any act, uh, criminal activity while a member. No, uh, three, no member will engage in violence except in the extremity of self-defense. Four, members will not gossip nor be divisive to the unity of the Second Rainbow Coalition. Five, members will not act as informers nor work against the purpose of the Second Rainbow Coalition. Six, no, nobody is authorized to speak for the Second Rainbow Coalition unless authorized to do so. All power. All Black power. power. All right. Shall we go on out now? You want to count us out, Sister Anna? Sure. I just want to say this has been amazing. And in some, as far as this chapter is concerned, yes. uh, though there's control and division <laughs> among the masses, especially the elite to the Hollywood a celebrity, it comes down to our attitude. And it's just um, a reflection of what I have said, you know, where um, you can be convinced that life is 10%, but what happens to you is 90% or how you react to it. And so it is with you that we are all in charge of our attitudes. So I'm gonna count down now, five, four, three, two, one. Black power. Oh.